Hello, and welcome to Talk of the Town. I'm Michael Jacoby, delighted to have you with us today. Uh, a dear old friend is joining us, and I'm particularly excited about it because we've got a very interesting subject to talk about. Uh, the obvious cliche way to say it would be after the cheering ends, but you still get a lot of cheers for yourself. My friend Rich Kelly. Hi, how you doing? How man? are you, buddy? Good to see you. It's good to see you. Yeah. Good to see you. We're going to talk a little bit about um, basketball, NBA 11 years? Yes, 11 years. 11 years, the pre-big money years, right? Well, if you ask the guys that played before me, yeah, that's true. we made pretty good money. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. What would you be making now? I'm sure 10x what I made yeah, yeah, then. Yeah. But uh, I, I wouldn't trade it. No. Uh, the scrutiny and the level of pressure and all is, those guys earn their money. Let's, let's go back to starting out. Uh, obviously, you're a tall fellow. Was basketball come naturally to you? I know you. I know your folks well, and they're tall as well. But did you just get out in the yard? And, did you have an you had, you had a good backyard hoop. That's you did. Sure. You had yeah. a great. You had yeah. the great lake right above the garage. Right. Uh -huh. um, but I played all sports. Right. Um, was naturally liked all sports, and it wasn't until really high school where. The uh, basketball coach kind of got a hold of me and kind of showed me that there was a, a level of commitment needed to really improve, and it got in my bloodstream then. Yeah, and you, you grew up as you were in high school. That was that the years of Chamberlain, and and um, sort of actually, before the, that. the the fellow that I kind of idolized that I thought a lot about was um, Lou Alcindor. Okay. Um, oh, okay, he was an articulate guy. And he'd written a book, and um, he was—he seemed more of my generation, and so I, I really read a lot about him, and I idolized him through high school. Yeah. Now, uh, of course, uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar now, and uh, played for John Wooden at UCLA. You went to Stanford. I did. Played at Stanford. You played at Woodside. I played at Woodside High in Redwood City. Okay. Um, I have a funny story about being recruited. Okay. The, 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 again, times were different back then. and I had made it pretty clear I was going to play on the West Coast. And um, So no free airline tickets. I, yeah, I didn't take, any, boond I didn't take <laughs> any boondoggle trips <laughs> back east. And uh, the, the recruiting was much more regional anyway back yeah. then. It's one of the reasons the Pac-8 at the time was able to compete so well is that all the kids in California stayed in, uh, in California. And I got recruited by UCLA, and I didn't want to go there. Because now, Wooden was there at the time? He was the coach okay. still, yeah. Did, yeah. You meet, did you meet with him? Yeah, I met with him. Um, um, but they had a kid named Bill Walton, who was yeah. a year older than me, yeah. and, and he was making a lot of noise, and I was like, I don't think I want to carry his bags for yeah. the next three or four years. And then USC had a very good program. Bill Boyd, Bob Boyd was the coach, and they had finished 29-2 uh, and two my senior year of high school, the only two losses being to UCLA. Oh. And they didn't even make the NCAA tournament because the winner because of the league had to, yeah. had to go to the tournament. So they put a really hard recruiting push on me. And everyone expected that I would go to Stanford because I grew up in... The shadow of Stanford, and both my parents went to Stanford, and and I didn't like the fact that everyone expected me to go there, and so I was thinking maybe I'd do something different. And after my final recruiting trip, I came back, and my parents looked at me and said, well, "So what do you think, son?" And I said, "You know, I think I'm going to go to USC." And my parents you both could, looked at me and they go, "You could hear your dad's <laughs> smile change." My my dad goes. You know, son, we really meant it when we said this is your decision and you can go anywhere you want. You just can't go to this. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I was secretly relieved. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting. You said you didn't want to go to UCLA because of carrying Walton's bags in three or four years. Three or four years is a concept that has fallen by the wayside. We have uh, now in college basketball so many one and done, which, yeah. of course, Kentucky's famous for uh, how has that changed? There were people just uh, well, the, 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 the biggest the biggest change to me is not so much the the one and done thing. Look, I'm an NBA player, and I, to keep somebody from going to work 
Uh, it's crazy. Yeah. You should be able to do it. I don't think you should change the rules. But the thing that I miss, and I think really would help the concept of student athletes better, is, is freshmen being ineligible. Okay. Because when I was playing, freshmen couldn't play varsity. Oh, really? You, yeah, I was the last freshman class that couldn't play varsity. So ineligible see, to play or ineligible to be drafted? No, ineligible to play oh, varsity. Okay. So you had a freshman year where you actually were much more of a student. Yeah. Um, it just it, it just turned you into more of a student. Yeah. Um, they, they changed that fairly quickly after I played, and freshmen could play varsity. But if, if they could just have that one year of being able to step back and take advantage of college without the pressure of being basically a professional athlete, because face it, if you're playing big time college yeah. basketball, you're a professional right. in terms of the time sure. yeah. And uh, I mean, we start from the school grounds, the odds are astronomical, even of making it in big time college ball. That step from big time college to drafted is still amazing low percentage, right? Yeah, exactly. There's so many kids that don't make it. They think they're going to make it. There's, they, they end up ending up going to Europe or playing in China. Or it's really hard to make it into the NBA now. Now, when you were at Stanford, do you um, do you declare for the draft? Is, is that how that no, works? Back Say then, as a sophomore, could you have declared? Um, I got drafted my after my junior year by the ABA. Okay. Uh, that league was still in existence. Right. That's where and Julius Irving and those guys were playing. Yeah, Julius Irving and those guys were, were uh, knocking it dead in the ABA. Um, so all the NBA did, they could... Actually, the NBA, I think, had rules against it, but the ABA, you could draft okay. under, um, undergrads. So you didn't have to declare right. in order to draft. There was no declaration. Okay. You just got drafted. Okay. And did you consider it? Not really. Okay. Um, no. Now, on one, on one side, you're saying, I want to get my four years done, I want to finish school, yeah. is the other side saying, because I know I'm going to go to the NBA? Yeah, I mean, I... I mean, you, did you expect it? I, I, yeah, I expected to and hoped to, but, and my career had been pretty good my sophomore and junior years, I was all league and all that, but I just didn't consider myself a man, I yeah. mean, I look at those guys playing, yeah. and... They were physically overpowered compared to what I... I mean, you had guys like Wes Unsel who were very big yeah, guys. exactly. Yeah. Um, what I was your playing weight? My playing weight in college was probably 220. And really? by the time I got to the NBA, it was probably 250 at the, at the highest. Um, I remember distinctly going to my first pro game as I was on the verge of getting drafted. And we had really good seats, and I was watching Julius Irving play against the New Jersey Nets, you know, New York Nets, um, in their playoffs. Because I was using the ABA, because I got drafted in the ABA as well, so there were, you got to trade off and kind of yeah. maximize your, your bargaining leverage. And Julius went in for a dunk on Artis Gilmore, and it was the most spectacular thing I'd ever seen in my life. And I looked at him, and I'm like, I, I, I'm about to get into this business. That's ridiculous. Because <laughs> yeah. I couldn't even dunk. Yeah. Remember, I'm in the college, dunking was illegal. Oh, it was then? Yeah. Okay. And so I hadn't practiced dunking, yeah. and all of a sudden these guys are throwing down with ferocity. I'm like, man, I've got some work ahead. Yeah, yeah. How, uh, did, you get, did you get drafted by Utah? No, I got drafted by New Orleans. New Orleans, Orleans, Orleans yeah. New Orleans Jazz when they actually had a name that had it's something kind of, to do with the town. <laughs> <laughs> now Jazz is in Utah and their town's in the Pelicans. Um, she got drafted by them. How many years with them? I played four seasons with them and then they moved to Utah. Right. Um, did you play with Stockton? Uh, yeah, I did. My next to last year, okay. it was his rookie year. Okay. So I did four years with the New Orleans Jazz. Then I got traded to New Jersey, and then I got traded to Phoenix. I did two and a half seasons there and bounced around a little bit more. Finished up with Utah for two and a half years, and then my last season was the first season of the Sacramento Kings moving out from Kansas City. How 
Uh, you know, often, because uh, I played some baseball, and and when you see guys that are the best players you've ever seen in your life, and they're not going anywhere, <laughs> you got to wonder what you're doing here. Mm-hmm. But how big was the adjustment, as you say, you're going into a, a business that's a, it's a total another ball game? It, it was big. I mean, I, you're used to being the star, right? and I was not the star, and I was physically getting brushed aside as if I was insignificant, and I, I kind of really had to make a commitment to beef up and take my work seriously and become a f- professional. By, the, by my third year, I felt like I was, I belonged, and I ended up playing 11 years. Well, with, uh, what year did they um, allow dunking back, or, or starting for the, I don't know. Uh, that's amazing. I, I would think that the center position would be all the more different going pro in that case, than, yeah. any, than any position. Right. Well, well, Bill Walton has a very elaborate um, theory that actually growing up when we did and learning to play the pivot okay. in the college game and high school game when you couldn't dunk actually made you a much more complete player because you had to develop touch and you had to yeah. stay a little further from the basket. and So I, I'm not complaining. Yeah. It was just a different way of playing. And you... Uh, did you play in a world championship? I played in some international yeah. events. Um, we played against the Russians. Now, I saw a bronze medal, which meant yeah. it was the Russians or something. Yeah, Eastern it America. was not the Olympics, and it wasn't as big. As, it was, I think, a World University Games or yeah. something. Okay. It was pretty intense. Yeah. And uh, international intrigue back then, because the Cold War was in yeah. full flower. Did you play there? Didn't play in Russia, no. This was in... Uh, we played in the Caribbean somewhere. Oh, really? Puerto Rico. <laughs> if you go, yeah. Yeah. All right. I'm sure the Russian players voted on that. <laughs> yeah, I think Puerto Rico would be nice. Uh, we're talking to Rich Kelly, uh, formerly of the Utah Jazz, 11 years in the NBA, and uh, we're going to talk about uh, what happens uh, to an athlete and the smart ones that, uh, that that keep it together. I want to talk a little bit about... Did you see the program, I think it was a 30-30, called Broke? That's no, remarkable exactly. talking about the percentage of athletes that within four or five years are bankrupt yeah. or have absolutely zero. The, the sad commentary. You're watching Talk of the Town. We'll be back with you in just a minute. Hi, Michael Jacoby here, executive producer of Jazz on the Plaza, a production of Los Gatos Music and Arts. You know, people often ask me how can they help support us and in doing so help keep jazz alive. Well, a couple of ways. One, you could get a corporation and give us a half million dollars. Yeah, that was worth a shot. Or two, you could buy some reserved seats. You buy some of the merchandise. And this year, with our tribute to Frank Sinatra, there's some wonderful fedora-logoed wine glasses along with shirts. And best of all, you could either check out the gala with the four freshmen or buy a jazz card. Now, the jazz card is just $100, a mere C-note, and there's $700 worth of value on it. All right. You give me one minute and these glasses, and I'll tell you exactly what you get. All right, start the clock. Go to Willow Street. It's good for one free pizza and a side salad. Go to Main Street Burgers. Good for a free burger, fries, and soda. Nothing but cakes. Good for buntinis. Go to Verge, the new restaurant, the Toll House, and get a free breakfast entree. Los Gatos Roasting Company. Free breakfast crepe and a large coffee. You can even get a horseback riding lesson at Bright Ranch in San Martin. Go to Rootstock, a sampler appetizer plate. At Skin Spirit, the new folks in town, it's good for one skin rejuvenating chemical peel. Jazz on the Plaza, a couple of VIP entries. Billy's Boston Chowder House, good for a free Boston Chapino lunch. Classic car wash, a classic car wash. What else? Arthur Murray, one free dance lesson. Chentanove, good for a free tiramisu. The Cats, a half a rack of ribs with a side. Chin Chin, free truffle fries. Gardino's, good for a free appetizer. And finally, Testarossa Winery, it gets you two passes for wine tasting and a couple of invites to an artesian wine cheese experience. $700 for just a $100 investment. Now it's your chance to help keep jazz alive and help the good folks at Los Gatos Music and Arts keep on keeping on. Come on. And we're back. Welcome to, ever tell you the story about when I was doing a deposition? Have you ever taken a deposition? I never have. Oh, I haven't. You know, they film it. And so, and every time they turn the camera on, I'd say, and we're back. 
And the lawyer said, you don't need to do that. I said, oh, that's all right. So they turned around and go, and we're back. <laughs> Finally, they just threw me out, but, that, but I digress. <laughs> and indeed, we are back to talk of the town with a, with a good buddy of mine, Rich Kelly. Uh, ranked 94th. This is the kind of a stat I need for uh, uh, dinner party trivia. Wow. 94th on the offensive rebound list. Did you know that? No, you got to check your Wikipedia. <laughs> check that. Now, um, are you are you a top hundred player? No, no, I'm not one of the top, top two, hundred. Did they go? How, how did they go to two hundred? <laughs> you played. You made the playoffs. Yeah, yeah. Met several years in the playoffs. Yeah. Both with Utah and with Phoenix. Yeah. Did you play with Barkley in Phoenix? No, he was uh, later. He later on. Okay. Yeah. I played yeah. with Alvin Adams okay. and Walter Davis and Paul Westfall in Phoenix. Best pure basketball player you ever played against? Against? Yeah. Or win? Well, the, the, the guy that I hated playing against the most was Moses Malone. Okay. Uh, particularly when he was with Houston before he went to Philly and, and won some championships. He was young, trying to prove himself, and he just took it personally, every possession. Yeah. I'll never forget a game where I wasn't feeling all that great and had kind of an injured ankle and a bit of the flu and came limping into the locker room and was, ah, I don't know if I can go. And the c players all gave me grief. Oh, you got Moses Malone flu. <laughs> uh, oh, screw that, I'll play, but I can show you. So I said, look, I'm gonna play, I'm not at full strength, but all I'm gonna do is box him out. Yeah. I'm just gonna use every ounce of energy to box him out. So the very first shot of the game goes up and I'm backing into him and pushing him out. He's five feet away from the basket, and he's turned around the wrong way. And the ball comes over my head. It was a brick of a shot. And he looks up, and he goes like this with one hand left-handed and tips it in. <laughs> and I go, ooh, this could be a long night. I feel the flu. <laughs> the flu's coming back. He ended up with 37 rebounds, 19 of them offensive, and wow. made my night horrible. Wow. <laughs> Who's the best teammate you ever played with? Best teammate I ever played with was Pete Maravich. Oh, you played with I Maravich. I played four years with Pete Maravich. Special guy, I would imagine. He was a really interesting guy. There was, you know, he's kind of, in my amateur psychological profile, he's kind of an undiagnosed manic depressive. Yeah. So there were plenty of times when he was on the manic side where it was just fabulous to be around him, and he was a fantastic player. But there were some complicated parts where he was on the yeah. depressive side, and it, it was difficult. But... There was a, there was a three-month period in his career when I was playing with him when he was, in my mind, one of the top three players in the league because he, he had deteriorated enough physically to where he realized he couldn't do everything anymore. And so that's a key period when really, really talented players actually become better because they realize they need their teammates. And there was, we were really good for a while there. And then he got hurt. And uh, his, that little peak period of his didn't last long, but it was about a one season brilliant period. Now, were endorsements a lot tougher to get in those days? Oh, man, I got one endorsement. You got <laughs> I, the shoe? I got a Converse shoe endorsement. I got $1,500 yeah. for wearing Converse. Did you get a lot of converse? But I, they they argued me back and only gave me a thousand in cash and five hundred in extra product. Extra product, that's fine. There, there, there was a funny story about Daryl Dawkins, yeah. who took endorsement money on shoes from two companies because oh. he knew where their various reps well, he were. He had a left and a right foot. He had a left yeah. and a right foot. And he had Converse and he had Pony, yeah. and so he gamed it because he knew that they wouldn't find out. Back then, there wasn't social media and stuff. But finally, they made the playoffs. Uh -oh. So now they're on national TV, and they're like, the, the jig was up. So he compromised and wore one of each. Yeah. Did he really? On national it. TV. <laughs> I don't know, we, uh, we alluded to the fact before the break, and there's a marvelous, and again, I think it's an ESPN uh, presentation of 3030 called Broke, talking about uh, uh, football players, uh, uh, NFL players, that something like 70% are bankrupt within five years. And for the NBA, it was 45%. Yeah. It was pretty remarkable. Um, of course, with those huge salary comes a lot of other complications and a lot of other uh, uh, entourages reaching with their hands out. At what point in your career uh, did you say, I, did you go into it saying, did we, or were you the invincible immortal when you started and going, I'm, I'm going to play this for 20 years? 
there's, there's just no getting around it, Mike. You've got a subset of, a tribal subset of 300 young men who are literally supermen, yeah. physically supermen. And to be as good as you are in that business, you have to believe that you're invincible. Yeah. And that carries through to every part of your daily activity. And it's no coincidence that people spend out of it because they think it isn't going to end. But is it, it's, it's, it's almost cause and effect that the, the, the first injury, you start maybe thinking college, yeah, going back a little bit. Well, you're knee out, I go a master's, if I can go for a doctorate. So you end your career, how old were you when you, when you finished? Uh, I was 34. 34. Could yeah. you have played longer? I probably had another year in me, but yeah. the uh, the salaries were, you know, they were nice, but they weren't enough to make it uncomfortable. And frankly, one of the reasons I retired when I did was because I was a little bit leery of being sucked forever into that little tribal place. Yeah. I, I wanted to get away and sort of see what the rest of the world was like. And does the NBA, did they have a good pension policy? It's pretty they good. It's, it's not as good as baseball. It's right. better than football. Um, and you, medical is... I mean, yeah, yeah, medical. That's, you're on the, your that's the thing that you really need, yeah. it seems to me, across the board. Yeah. Okay, so, and it, were you thinking maybe at 30 you're starting to think, I'm going to wrap this up at some point? Was it a number of injuries or just... No, nah, it was just... I it just it. was not as effective. Yeah. I, mean, you know, I was just wearing out. How were well, your best year? How old were you? My best year, I was 27. 27. Yeah. All right. So you decided to go back uh, to Stanford. Uh, I went back to Stanford Business School. Okay. Um, it was a... Uh, and there's a tribal aspect to that as well. Okay. I mean, I mean, it's like the Marine Corps <laughs> and the network, trust me. So, I mean, but that's, that's part and parcel of that. And uh, Yeah, uh, there is, but... Um, I, you know, I'd never turned on a computer in my okay. life. Um, I hadn't really hit. The what books. was your What was your major? I was a psych major. Psych major. You know, okay. um, um, <clears throat> I I had to go back to and basically for six months before the entrance exam. Uh, I had to kind of bone up and yeah. remember how to calculate the square footage of a rhombus yeah. and all the questions that are so important. <laughs> Things you can't go through the day without, yeah. Exactly. And uh, I was lucky enough to get into Stanford, and it was a, it was a great reindoctrination period for me. Um, it makes a difference. When I went to undergrad there, you know, I was on a scholarship, but in business school, you, you write your own tuition check, and yeah. that makes you pay attention a little yeah, bit. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. <laughs> and uh, it was a great opportunity for me to just without a lot of risk, experiment with different ways of making a living. Uh, the typical way an NBA player does it is they get out, and now they're kind of thrown out, and somebody will approach them and say, hey, I'm going to doing a restaurant with you. And they go, oh, okay, what do I do? Well, you just loan us your name and maybe your balance sheet. I can borrow this money and do that, and the next thing you know... You've learned the restaurant game at a very expensive price. Um, which, is, a co uh, which is how to make a large fortune, a very small exactly, one, open a restaurant. Exactly. Yeah. I had a, a, a teammate that I played with that did just that. Um, and within two years, his partner disappeared on him and left him wow. high and dry. And he pulled out of it because he basically started going to work at four in the morning and learning how to do it. And he's been running a very successful business for right. 30 years, but not many guys have that fortitude. Um, so, so acclimating from the pros back to school, because mm -hmm. one is the you know the eye uh, the eye on the prize, and the other is that there's a new prize and mm -hmm. a, a new way to look at it. Was did you start business school with anything in mind? I had some vague ideas about maybe getting into. Uh, um, business with some of my classmates. I yeah. knew that the value of the Stanford education yeah. was the network, and I was going to school with some smart guys who were going to be changing the world, and if I could just yeah. kind of draft off them a little, and I had a little money, I could maybe invest in some of their stuff, I could do that. we got a couple minutes left, but I want to talk about Search Fund Partners, mm -hmm. which is your company. Tell me a little bit about it. So Search Fund Partners is a small private equity fund 
and we invest in young guys in their early 30s that are on the on the make to try to buy a small regular old boring business we invest in them while they look for the business and then when they find it we invest in the acquisition of the business and hopefully they can take a nice business turn it up a notch and turn it into a great business when when you were growing up or when you got out of uh, got out of the game was were there companies like that or is, is that a relatively new the venture capitalist concept, particularly the concept of investing in them and helping them? Um, I, I think the venture game kind of came to the forefront in the late 70s. That's sort of where the Sand Hill Road gang got yeah. started. Um, that was more of a question of backing ideas yeah. and, and founders. We've got a little different make in that we're buying existing businesses and they already have customers and they're not they're not raw ideas, but we are just betting on people. Yeah. Very hands-on? Yeah, pretty hands-on. Yeah. So you, you, you look at a potential uh, a guy and you say, I, this is, I see a little bit of me and him, and this is, I, this I, I, is I, how I might have handled it. This yeah, guy's doing it. You know. Exactly. And, and to see whether they're coachable. Yeah, that's uh, the key. Well, it's not and, the key. And um, I, I use a lot of my basketball and competitiveness and team stuff yeah. in my work as an investor. Yeah. You also you serve on a dozen boards, it seems. It's just like yeah, I'm on a lot of company boards, and that, again, that's just an extension of the coaching, except yeah. it's taking it out on a more formal yeah. basis. Yeah, you work with a lot of charities as well. Yeah, a little bit. A little bit. Yeah, uh, that's in your DNA, giving back. And yeah, that's, that's an important thing. Yeah, it is. I think I think it's in everybody's DNA, yeah. given a chance. Some some closer to the surface than others. Yeah. Tell me quickly about what five, ten year plan, where are you, where are you going? Oh, we started this business um, 12 years ago, and my partners and I have grown a nice little franchise, and we're sort of at the peak of where I'd hope we'd be. So I, I hope to just be working and enjoying life yeah. and staying healthy and yeah. for, for quite a while. Yeah. Folks, I mean, is it of any value for folks to look at your website? Is it? Well, it gives you an idea of the companies we invest in. It's okay. just searchfundpartners.net. Okay. All right. Good to see you, my friend. Great to see you. Thank you for coming in. I appreciate right. it. Rich Kelly, uh, that is, uh, I almost said jazz tonight, that is the talk of the town. And uh, next week we'll be talking to Roger Maltby from NBC Sports. Uh, we're working on Coach Mariucci. Uh, and Mr. Wozniak, if you ever answer your phone, you're certainly invited. Until next time, I'm Jacoby. I'll see you soon.